Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, go ahead and send it to me. Uh, Box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And uh, become one of our uh, fans on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Before we do get started, I do want to encourage you to check out Audible if you haven't already. Audible is a great service that allows you to get one audiobook per month as well as an audio subscription to your choice of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. You can listen to great mysteries like those featuring uh, Nero Wolf, Sherlock Holmes, or Poirot, the latest bestsellers both in fiction or nonfiction, for just one low price. You can get a two-week free trial and get a free audiobook by going to audiblepodcast.com slash oldtimeradio. That's audiblepodcast.com slash oldtimeradio. Well, let's get into uh, today's episode of Nero Wolf, The Case of the Vanishing Shells. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Mr. Wolf? No, he isn't. Huh? Oh, well, <laughs> for you, maybe he is. I'm not here. Oh, yes, yeah. He's always here. I've gone out. No, no. He seldom ever goes out. I won't start on anything tonight. Oh, well, sure. He'd love to start on a case tonight. What's your name? Oh, that's a beautiful name. Address? Archie, uh, it's another woman. Hang up. No, no, no. Honest, I'm not Mr. Wolf, but I'm his agent. Yeah, I'll be right over, miss. Goodbye. What's her trouble? Where are you going? Well, she said she's received some threatening notes and she's afraid to leave her hotel. So long, boss. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. We prefer to call tonight's story the case of the vanishing shells. It didn't seem to be difficult at first, but... Well, I'm not a stupid individual, but so often... Ooh, so often I allow myself to become mesmerized by beautiful women. Eh, heaven bless them. Doris Murray was such a woman. She phoned us first late one afternoon about 5 o'clock. Then again at 5.30. Very well, Mr. Goodwin, but I, I would prefer to see Mr. Wolf. Well, I said I'd be there at 6, Miss Murray. I don't want to talk any longer on the phone. Please hurry. There, there's someone at the door. I'll see you in the cocktail lounge at your hotel. At six o'clock. That's half an hour. Don't fail. Who is it? Emil Stoner. Oh, come in, Emil. You got my call, darling. Here, let me take your briefcase. Uh, I, I'll just put it here on the piano, Doris. Oh, I'm terribly upset about those... Threatening notes, darling. I, I know it's upset you, too, but I'm determined to find out who it is. I'm not going to let them bluff me out of my first chance to play the star part in one of your shows. But look, Doris, there's that other part. Other? Is that all I mean to you? Well, what can they divulge that'll harm us? What? Several things. And I can't afford... A, I mean at this time... You're frightened, Amo. Doris, I'm going to give the star part to Paula. Paula! You've been divorced for four years. Why? Because I feel she can... Can play it better. Is that what you're going to say? Well, I can act rings around her. Now, 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 look, Doris. I know it's a big disappointment to you, but that's the way it is. Get out. Get out. Go on across the hall to Paula. Give her the part. Louse up your show. She and that playwright of hers. Get out, Emil. But, Doris... You frightened little... Get out! I believe, Mr. Wolf, you're making a great mistake in not coming along. Indeed. I'm sure that what attracts you could not possibly be of interest to me. A gal needs help. 
Money is money. Girls, money, fooey. Yeah, well, we could have dinner out for a change. They have one of the finest chefs in town at that hotel. You're most impolite. I'm trying to read this book. Poetry. Archie. Uh, yes, sir? Shut up. Uh, uh, well, we need money. That filthy green cabbage is necessary to our existence. This may be a tough case, you know. I. You're sufficiently intelligent. Sometimes. Mm. If I sat around like you do, I'd weigh 500 pounds, too. Archie, leave the room. Besides, it's only 300. What a way to run a business. Orchids, beer, books. <laughs> Don't keep the charming client waiting. Okay, I'm going, I'm going. And always remember, there is a telephone. Thank you, waiter. <clears throat> oh, good evening, Miss Moray. I'm Archie Goodwin. Well, I didn't expect... Uh, I mean, please sit down. Well, I think I should explain the absence of Nero Wolf. <laughs> there's, uh, there's so much of him that it's not too convenient to transport it about. I do all the outside work. And I'm sure you do it well. Uh, Mr... Well, you know, some women call me Goodwin and some call me Mr. Goodwin. And, uh... Yes? Uh, the unattached call me Archie. Hello, Archie. Oh, splendid. I'm glad to hear it. Now we can get right down to the nasty old business that's troubling you, Doris. First, here's the 500 retainer fee. Well, you thank you. Now, what's the note about? Well, there are two notes, both printed by hand. Uh-huh. Oh, will you hand me my purse, please? Oh, sure. Thank you. Oh, I see. Doris Moray, if you fail to withdraw from the cast of Stoner's next production by start of rehearsals Monday, both you and Stoner will have a blasted reputation and perhaps other injuries... From which you will be unable to recover. The other one is like it, only more vehement. Yeah, someone or a group of someones are intent on keeping you out of Stoner's shows, huh? It's too bad. His next one is said to be a sure smash hit. And a star-making part for the leading woman. Yes, Emil Stoner wants me to play it. He's been planning on it ever since David Banning wrote the play. What does David Banning think of you playing the part? Well, I... I don't think he's too enthused about it. You see, Mr. Stoner and Paula Kenyon have been divorced for four years, but... She has continued to be his top leading woman. Now she's engaged to David Banning, who wrote this play. Oh. Makes things a bit difficult. Well, of course, Rick Hunter, Stoner's director, is... Hunter's somewhat in favor of your playing the part. Well, Rick Hunter is very fond of my work. And very fond of you as well, huh? Yes, unfortunately. I... I like Rick Hunter tremendously, but... Amos Stoner has been of greater interest to me... In fact, we're more or less engaged, Mr. Goodwin. Oh, well, had any words lately with the ex-Mrs. Stoner, Paula Canyon? Is that her name? Paula and I were great friends when I first joined the Stoner Productions, but I don't know, she... I, I don't think she appreciated the fact that Mr. Stoner and Rick Hunter, the director, took such an interest in me. Tell me, did you ever think you were in love with Rick Hunter? Yes, at first I was thrilled by his artistic imagination. And then as time went on, I realized that he was subject to melancholia. Mr. Stoner was more stable, and I needed someone older to advise me. Well, what's wrong with your reputation at Mr. Stoner's? Well, there's nothing I fear, but I'm afraid Mr. Stoner is somewhat disturbed by these threats. He, he feels there is something in his past of sufficient import to really harm him. I, I think it's nonsense. Well, then what we have to do is uncover this person or persons before you end up with ruined careers on Broadway. Where does the ex-Mrs. Stoner live? Well, as a matter of fact, she lives just down the hall from me. Lived here for years. Oh, well, I think it's advisable, honey, that you stay close to your room until we solve this thing. Oh, but I'm not afraid for my life, Archie. No? Well, I am. I'll see you into your room, Doris. Oh, now, please, Mr. Goodwin, oh, if you... Oh, you don't trust the boy, huh? Oh, well, I... Such beautiful eyes. Oh, I... Lovely red hair. Yeah. You could have the lead in my new play. I never wrote one, but for you, I'll try anything. <laughs> Come along. Here's your bag. Well, hello, Doris. Oh, Hello, Rick. Mr. Goodwin, this is Rick Hunter. Hiya, Hunter. Nice shows you've been putting on. I've just been admiring your work, Goodwin. Hey, oh, well, that's nice. I'm glad. Nothing like encouragement for a beginner, Mr. Hunter. You're ready for the big time from what I saw. Heard from Emil Stoner today, Doris? I talked to him once this morning. Uh, have you been sitting in the cocktail lounge all afternoon? Yeah. <laughs> that I have, honey. I want to see you play that lead, baby. And I think I just about got it all settled. Dreaming about it won't settle it. Licker never accomplished anything in itself, Rick. Come on, Mr. Goodwin. He's a very jealous man, Doris. In fact, right now, I can feel his thoughts piercing me between the shoulder blades. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Here's a phone book. Yes, 
this, Archie? How do you know it's Archie? I felt the time was exactly right for you to call. I wish you felt it was time to earn some money. Is this a worthwhile case? Well, she's a beautiful redhead, and, uh... And that, of course, makes it very worthwhile. Yeah, well, I got 500 as a retainer. Fooey, a pittance, and probably all you'll ever get. What do you mean by that? She's probably guilty. Now, look, boss, she's the victim. Received notes threatening her reputation and her health if she plays the star part in Emil Stoner's new production. Also, they threaten Emil Stoner, likewise. The playwright, Dave Banning, is engaged to Paula Kenyon. Incidentally, she lives here at the hotel, too, just down the hall from Doris. I remember her. And the playwright wants Paula Kenyon to play the part. Well, Archie, you have only the beginning. It is probably too late to prevent whatever is going to happen. Like what, for instance? Have you found a body yet? Call me after you find the body. What body? There's no body. But there will be, Archie. There's always a body where you are concerned. Either a body beautiful or a dead one. Right? Thanks for seeing me to my room, Archie. Oh, I'm not stopping here, Doris. I'll take a look inside. But I'm not... Oh, I insist. Part of my job, you know. If I fail to take every precaution, Mr. Wolf would never... But look in that chair. Amos. Emil? Emil Stoner? Uh, uh, oh, three red dots on his shirt front. Uh-uh. Uh, Doris, Doris, hold on. I, I'm all right. Yes, I, I'm all right. All right, sit down. That's it. Uh, now, let's see. The body's still warm. What's his crumpled in his left hand? A horoscope. Between the fingers of his right hand, an unlit cigarette. My grand PK. Paula Kenyon. This horoscope is from March... Something he picked up from your desk here? I don't believe in astrology. Where'd he get this cigarette with Paula Kenyon's monogram? Oh, poor Emil. Poor Emil. I, I didn't believe anyone would really harm us. Oh, I wish I said stop it. When did you see him last? Please, shouldn't we do something? Call the police. No, 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 not yet. When did you see him? Why, I, I saw him this morning. I, I'm so shocked I can hardly think clearly. Doris. Yes, there's a briefcase here on the piano with a newspaper on top of it. What? Oh, it, it is, yes. It's, it's Emil's. He, he must have left it here this morning. That's strange. Emil Stoner was bald, but... But what? Well, I'm sure he's a man who always wore a hat, but I see no hat. He must have come up the elevator as I went down to meet you. Who would know he'd come up here? Your director, Rick Hunter, he said he'd been in the bar all afternoon. What else was it he said? Thought he had everything just about settled. Oh, no, Rick couldn't. He just... Oh, Mr. Goodwin, I, I couldn't believe that. I can believe anything about anybody. I learned that the hard way. In my book, everybody's guilty until proved otherwise. Even you, baby. What? Even you. Yeah. The Herald Tribune newspaper. Are you sure you haven't seen him since this morning, Doris? What are you doing? Absolutely nothing. Someone came in here and shot him. Called the police. I insist. Maybe... What? Maybe I did leave my door unlocked. Why did I do that? Well, he couldn't have opened the door otherwise, could he? No. Give me the check room, please. Oh, hello. Did you, uh... Do you know Mr. Emil Stoner, the producer? You do? Well, uh, tell me, did he check his hat with you this afternoon or this evening? He didn't, huh? All right, thanks. He must have carried it up here to this floor. Doris, do you have a gun? I own a gun. A small twenty-five automatic. But it's not here. Where is it? I had the handle repaired and it's been in my dressing room for a week or two. I hate to do this, Doris, but I'm going to move the body away from the back of that chair. Oh. There. Yeah, three wounds. One bullet went through the upper part of the chest, out the middle of the back. See, right through the heart. By the angle of the wound, he was shot while sitting down. Please, Mr. Goodwin, must we stay here? I, I want to I, give I... this room a thorough going over. We'll go down to the lobby. I want to use that phone booth again. And, Doris, I hope... I know what you're going to say. You hope that gun of mine... Is still in your dressing room at the theater. Mr. Wolf speaking. Oh, Mr. Wolf, may I have your autograph? I'm taking a correspondence course on how to be a detective, and I think you're a wizard. <laughs> so kind of you to say so. I would be just thrilled to have your autograph on the bottom of a paycheck. Why are you calling from a phone booth? What? Who said I was? 
It's obvious. There's no room tone reverberation. Oh, well, you shouldn't have to ask. You know everything before it happens. You found the body then. Happened just before you got there. Oh, now, look. I took the girl up to a room to be sure it was safe for her to go in, and... <laughs> okay, okay. And there, sitting in a big leather chair, was Emil Stoner. Shot three times with a small caliber gun, dead about an hour. One shot went through the body from the upper part of the chest to the middle of the back. Therefore, he was shot while sitting down. The killer was standing, huh? I'm listening. Oh. Well, his left hand was clutching a horoscope folder, and between the index and second finger of the right hand was an unlit cigarette with a monogram on it, P.K. Emil Stoner is bald, but there was no hat in the room. However, on the piano was his briefcase, and on top of it, a four o'clock afternoon edition of the Herald Tribune. Better look in the briefcase, Archie. No weapon? No, no weapon. But Doris Murray says she owns a twenty-five caliber automatic, and it's in her dressing room at the theater. Also, she claims she hadn't seen Stoner since this morning. You found no empty shells about the floor? None. What did you do with the bullet? What bullet? The one which passed through his chest and lodged in the back of the leather chair. Are you there? Boss, I'm a very stupid fella. Stop bragging. The bullet. Boss, there ain't no hole in the back of that chair. I just realized it. Maybe he was standing up. Ah, then the killer must have been on stilts. Archie, let us pretend, only pretend, that you're very observant. Now proceed to Paula Kenyon's apartment, just down the hall, you said, and see what she knows without divulging the fact that Stoner is dead and look sharp. My gears must be slipping. Archie, do you know what great event will be celebrated tomorrow? Yeah, my birthday. What'd you get me? Cuthbert's Correspondence Detective Course in Four Easy Lessons. Bye. This is Paul's apartment. No answer. Let's see if it's open. Ah, there's no one in sight. Come on in. Now, look, if anyone walks in on us, we found the door open and we just came in to wait, huh? Which is the truth, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Ah, here on the desk we have a stack of horoscope stars and a box of Paula's monogrammed cigarettes. Mr. Goodwin. Huh? This is Amos gray fedora hat. And he was in this apartment this afternoon. What are you staring at? Oh, small pearl-handled automatic. Yes. Twenty-five caliber. Yeah, it's been fired very recently. We won't touch it now. Does it look like yours? Archie, it is mine. Y- your initials? I found old Jenkins, the stage doorman at the theater, to look in my dressing room. and Well, my gun isn't there. Did you leave the gun out in plain view in the dressing room? Yes, for several days anyway. Then I put it behind the mirror. I suppose many people have seen it. Then. I'm sure. I hope, Doris, that your fingerprints are not the only ones on that gun. If they use my gun to shoot him in my apartment, why would they bring the gun back here and leave it in plain well, sight? maybe they didn't do it just that way. No. His hat's here, the gun is here, and yet he's dead in your apartment. How can you answer that? Well, maybe he was sitting here waiting for Paula and someone called him out and over to your place and shot him. Ah, that's not good. Doesn't make sense. Now, if he was sitting in this chair here and someone entered that door, it'd be... Hey. What is it? Look in the chair back. Huh? Little round hole. Start looking for some empty shells around here. Find something? No, I want to make a call. He was shot with this automatic. Three shells were ejected. They certainly vanished. You know who's speaking? Archie, I'm in Paula Kenyon's. She's not here. Found his hat, a stack of horoscopes on the desk, box of monogrammed cigarettes, a twenty-five automatic which belongs to Miss Moray, recently fired, but not an empty shell in sight. No blood, but a single small hole in the back of the chair near the desk. Doris Moray is with me. I will call Inspector Kramer now about the body and have ballistics check the bullets with the gun. And the bullet in the chair back? Did you find anything of particular importance in Emil Stoner's briefcase? Yes, I found... Never mind. Bring the girl here at once. Okay, boss. Say, don't you think I'd better wait for Paula Kenyon? Uh-oh, here she is. Bye. Bring her along, too, if you can. Goodbye. Hello, Paula. Well, Doris, what are you doing here? I wasn't aware that I left the door unlocked. Seems to be contagious this evening. I left mine unlocked, too. Hello, Dave. Uh, Miss Kenyon, Mr. Goodwin. Hello, Doris. Hello. 
Archie, this is Dave Banning, the playwright. How are you, Mr. Banning? How do you do? I've heard all about your new play, and I want to meet you. Doris thought you might be over here, and the door was ajar, so we, well... I just walked in. I hope you don't mind, Paul. Certainly not. I'm used to people just walking in. We were here a while ago and went down to the cocktail lounge for a while. When does the play open, or have you cast it yet? Mr. Stoner handles that part of it. Are you a prospective investor, Goodwin? Oh, I've had a number of flings in the business. Matter of fact, I expect to see Mr. Stoner tonight. You do? Tonight? Here? I don't understand. What's this fencing all about? Doris, you're not just visiting me. We've hardly spoken for... Oh. Is that your gun, Miss Kenyon? It's yours, Doris. Yes, that's right, Paula. He was in my dressing room. When did you see Mr. Stoner last? I haven't seen him today. I had lunch with him. Why? What hat did he wear at lunchtime, Mr. Banning? Why, the gray fedora. How did it get here? That's Amos. What is this? What are you two doing here? Where is Amos? Come on, cut out the melodramatics. Mr. Stoner is dead. He's what? Paula. And without any further explanation, I shall have to ask you to accompany me downtown. Police? If you will, please. They're still in the front room, boss. I'll bring them into your office when you're ready. Yes, R.J., I'm sure they're all anxious to talk. They've been sitting there for an hour now. Maybe we ought to make some sort of explanation to them, huh? Why? This sort of technique should work very well in this particular instance. Yeah, but I don't know about that director, Rick Hunter. He may be difficult. Does anyone know that you found the completed and signed contract in the briefcase? No one. Mm -hmm. Good. Now we have the threat notes, the contract... The afternoon newspaper, the briefcase, the fedora hat, the gun, no ejected shells, the holoscope, the cigarette, and the two chairs. One with a small hole in it. Come in. Ah, Inspector Kramer at last. Uh, what have you? Well, we covered every inch of that place and didn't find a single empty shell. There were two bullets in the body and the one that passed through him into the chair back in Paula Kenyon's place. They were all free fired from Doris Murray's little automatic. Any fingerprints on the gun? None but Doris Murray's. Not unexpected, to say the least. The bullet that was lodged in the chair in Paula's place went through his heart. Now, he was apparently shot in her room, but... Uh... But how did he get into Doris Murray's place? I'll be able to explain that when we locate those three empty shells, Inspector. Bring our guests in, Archie. Come in, please. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nero Wolf, Miss Paula Kenyon. Hello. Miss Doris Murray. Hello, Mr. Rick Hunter, the director. How do you do? David Banning, the playwright. How do you do? Won't you be seated, please? May I present Inspector Kramer of Homicide? How do you do, Inspector? Yeah. Mr. Wolf has asked you here to give such details as you recall, which might be of assistance to him in the solution of the murder of Emil Stoner. Mr. Hunter, as the director, whom did you favor as the star of your next production? Why, Doris Murray. You have been deeply interested in Miss Murray? Hasn't done me much good. But you do love her? I do. And you are deeply interested in the progress of her career? I am, most assuredly. Did you know that Mr. Stoner had made out and signed a contract for a certain woman to play the lead in the new show? No. You knew that Doris Murray had a gun in her dressing room? Yes. You were in the hotel cocktail lounge all afternoon until you met Doris and Mr. Goodwin? Yes. And you could have seen Emil Stoner into the lobby and go to the elevator. I could. Could you prove that you never left the cocktail lounge until you met Doris and Archie? Maybe not. Did you see Mr. Stoner go into the elevator? I did. Mr. Banning, you wrote the new play. Were you in favor of Miss Murray playing the part? I know. I felt Paula Kenyon was better suited for it. You and Miss Kenyon are engaged to be married? Yes. Anything happened to Mr. Stoner, you as next in line could assign the role as you saw fit? That's correct. Did you know that Mr. Stoner had made a final decision on the part? I did not. He didn't tell you anything about it at lunch today? No, I made a strong plea for Paula. You know about the gun in Miss Murray's dressing room? Everyone did, apparently. Very well. Uh, Miss Kenyon, did Emil Stoner visit your apartment often? Not often. We were not on too friendly terms. Did you phone him to visit you this afternoon? No, who said I did? No one? <laughs> I merely asked. Were you, by any chance, still in love with Emil Stoner? Now, see here, I don't appreciate that kind Just of talk. Just relax, Mr. Banning. I was not in love with Mr. Stoner. That was over. You and Doris Murray were at one time very friendly. Yes. Well, I found out how two-faced she was. 
Emil was a fool to fall for her, but you couldn't tell him anything. All she's interested in is a career. You're not interested in your career, Miss Kenyon. Well, well, yes, in a way. You wanted the star part. You phoned Sterner this morning. Yes, but he said he was going to give it to her. You knew about Doris's gun? No, I you didn't. You recognized it immediately, boss. Well, yes, I knew. What if I did? Then you wrote these threatening notes to Miss Murray. I did not. I did not. You didn't know the contract had already been signed? No. Then you still had a motive to kill him. I wrote those notes. She had nothing to do with it. You can check them on my typewriter. We know, Mr. Banning. We've already done it. I know how it looks, but but Paula didn't do it. I, I knew he was coming to her place. I called him. I, I knew Paula was out. I did it. If so, what did you do with the ejected shell? I threw them away. How many? Three. Oh, no, David. Please don't. I don't believe you, Mr. Banning. Miss Murray, did you know the contract had been made out and signed? No. You're lying, Miss Murray. You said you didn't see Stoner this afternoon. I didn't. You called him and asked him to visit you. You did get the threat notes and they frightened you. But you didn't know they would frighten Stoner. I did not phone him, nor did I see him. Yes, you did. His briefcase was on the piano. And he was there in the late afternoon because he brought with him a four o'clock edition of the Herald Tribune. What if he was there? I didn't kill him. He told you then about his decision. He left hurriedly. We got the briefcase and went to Paula's apartment to wait for her. That's not true. That's not true. Filled with rage, you got your gun, which you said had disappeared from your dressing room, then calmly put it into your bag, walked across the hall, and shot him as he sat reading a horoscope. No, no, no. Archie, her handbag. Thank you. Notice. I run my finger through a hole in the corner. She fired through the bag. And see... Three empty shells. No. And here's a contract made out to Paula Kenyon. Too bad, Miss Murray. Well, that's a good day's work, boss. Some beer, Archie. Right. Say, tell me, how did Stoner, if he was shot in Paula's room, get back to Doris's room? She couldn't carry him. Oh, now, Archie, that's not too difficult. He walked. Shot through the heart? Impossible. That's a fallacy, Archie. Official medical records show that people have walked a block in such instances. No wonder Doris was so shocked when she saw him back in her room. The shooting took place after she called us, and it seemed unbelievable that anyone would leave the gun and not the ejected shells. Ergo, the gun must have been concealed when fired. Yeah. Paula would have no reason to do that, because she was in her own apartment. And these men are not the type who would have fired through their coats. And Doris, before she started down the hall, would naturally conceal the gun, huh? In her handbag. Where else? Boss, midnight. It's another day. <laughs> I'm a year older. Yes. Hmm. Cuthbert's correspondence detective course in four easy lessons. <laughs> Happy birthday, Archie. Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Gerald Moore as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Betty Lou Gerson, Bill Johnstone, Peter Leeds, and Vic Perrin. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Party for Death. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Welcome back. Well, in this one, Wolf uh, really uh, operated uh, much more like a traditional genius detective in the normal uh, Nero Wolf fashion. 
And it turned out that his instincts were dead on about the case and what they would uh, collect from it. And I'm all, I'm kind of sorry this is the last uh, Gerald Moore episode. It seems like once Green Street and an Archie Goodwin work, uh, work together where they've got some real chemistry going, that the uh, Archie Goodwin uh, departs. I had the same thought with uh, Lawrence Dobkin uh, previous to Moore, but this, this one I think really could have worked out well uh, over the long run. Well, I've also been listening and uh, watching quite a bit of uh, Nero Wolf. Um, got the um, audio book, uh, Not Quite Dead Enough, a couple uh, interesting uh, Nero Wolf uh, novellas, and also uh, Black Orchids. And I finally saw the uh, Golden Spiders, which predated the uh, Nero Wolf uh, mystery series on a and &E. I'm kind of disappointed to be through that because I enjoyed that series so much. I'm skeptical that anybody's going to quite get that same level that uh, Timothy Hutton had. Uh, really, Hutton's was just uh, picture uh, perfect, I thought. And the way he did the visuals and the sets, truly remarkable. I'm afraid the next Nero Wolf series might be with computer animation or something. Ooh, and that's going to be... All right, now on to more pleasant thoughts. Uh, we got some comments on my article I did, a uh, review of Johnny Staccato. In the review, I made a m reference to the fact of the uh, term uh, Swinging Long Hair was the title of the last Johnny Staccato episode. Uh, and I noted there wasn't anybody, not even a woman in there, that had long hair. Tim uh, writes back, Adam, I look forward to viewing this series if I ever come across it. In answer to your comment about swinging long hair, since the show has a jazz motif, the phase might refer to playing classical music, long hair music, in a jazz tempo. Uh, keep up the great work. I enjoy your podcast, and particularly your commentary. Thanks so much. That uh, translation helps. Although, I guess it would have helped if the classical musician, because there was a classical musician who came and was uh, playing uh, just like that in a jazz uh, tempo. So that does make a lot of sense. And then we do have a comment uh, from Tom, says, uh, Sadly, Cassavetes, uh, John Cassavetes, the star of uh, Johnny Staccato, rarely cared for any role he didn't create. And uh, Cass Savetis actually took the very extraordinary step, I mentioned this in my review, of uh, publicly criticizing his own program to get it canceled so he could go and work on other projects. And he actually got it canceled 12 episodes early. Um, one thing I did find in my research, uh, I found a lot of l interesting little nuggets about the actual uh, Johnny uh, Staccato uh program and its production and what Cassavetes uh, thought of it uh, and why it was a 27 episode run when 39 episodes was more or less the uh, norm for a television series back then. Um, but I did notice that a lot of the writers got some details about the show, about the actual show and the way it played out, what it was like. They got it uh, wrong. I've just sat there and I've, you know, I watched all 27 episodes over the last uh, month or two. And sometimes the descriptions of what the show was like just, just seem totally foreign to uh, reality. And I guess if there's a lesson in there, it's, it's to kind of be careful uh, in terms of judging whether a show is going to be good or not. If the author who is talking about it, you know, hasn't seen it in 30 or 40 years. Because the situation with Johnny Staccato is because there were so few episodes made, uh, there wasn't really any history of syndication. Uh, you basically had what I call gray market DVDs uh, floating around uh, with Staccato on it, and that would have been probably the main people who would have seen it. There just, was just an episode or two released here or there. So the consequences any TV critics say writing about in the 1990s or 2000s uh, they're writing from memory, they're writing from what they've heard from other people about the show, rather than based on first-hand knowledge. So it was an interesting phenomenon. It, it even uh, ended up in the uh, New York Daily News uh, from 2002, found a piece that was uh, totally inaccurate as to the way the series actually worked. 
So hopefully as more of these shows become available, some of the myths that have grown up about some of them will also be busted over time. All right, well, that'll do it for now. We'll be back tomorrow with Let George Do It. In the meanwhile, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Remember, cast your vote for us on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And follow us over on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Uh, from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.